and uh, we looked at his, his prayer request and uh, the prayers that he prayed and um, looked at his conversion. And tonight we're going to look at the heart and the thrust of what he his uh, whole life was about after conversion. And uh, it's summed up in one word, which is the title of the message tonight, and it's uh, reconciled. And that's what we're going to talk about. Colossians chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Colossians chapter 1 and verses 19 through 22. We're going to take these verses and look at them and pull them apart and see what God <clears throat> has to show us and, and based on, on the life of the Apostle Paul. And hopefully you can find uh, the things to apply to your life as we go through these. And we would all be better Christians uh, based on, on these examples. But Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, uh, the Bible says that for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross... By him to reconcile all things unto him, by him, I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and, uh, excuse me, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And we're going to stop there. Normally I would continue reading the entire sentence, but that's quite a long sentence that he keeps on. It's several more verses, but we're going to uh, just pause there and uh, just draw some applications from this. Uh, but after we pray, Lord, again, just to take a time to just ask you to bless during this time and bless the, uh, uh, the reading of your word and Pray that you would just uh, use me tonight as you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So reconciled, you know, uh, um, we have to reconcile our bank statement. And, you know, trying to uh, do that and figure out, make sure you got the same amount the bank says you have and, and they hadn't cheated you or anything, you know. And I can't stand for mine to be off any, you know. And uh, uh, it's okay if they made the mistake and I got more money, but I don't want it to be the other way around, you know. Um, one time when my oldest son Benjamin was here in the States, we were in Haiti. Uh, he'd come, come to college and everything, and uh, um, uh, he called me in Haiti, and he said, he said, Dad, what does NSF mean? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the bank sent me this thing that says NSF, and it said something about the my, uh, you know, not being able to cover, you know. I said, that means non-sufficient funds. I said, uh, I said, did when you reconciled your bank statement, I said, do you remember I showed you how to do that in uh, business math, you know, when we were homeschooling and everything. Remember how I showed you to sit down with the, the check and the bank statement and everything? I said, when you reconciled your bank statement, did it match? And he said, he said, yeah, sort of. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, I said, well, let me ask you this question, Benjamin. I said, have you reconciled your bank statement? He said, yeah, I think. And, I said, and I'm getting a little more nervous, a little more nervous, you know. And I said, I said, okay, when is the last time you've reconciled your bank statement? He said, well, I really can't remember. I said, okay. I said, don't spend any more money. Don't put that card in anywhere else. I said, you know, you, you have spent more money than you have. He said, well, I looked online and it said I had enough. I said, but the stuff hadn't cleared yet. I said, you can't, you can't just spend money. I said, you have to write stuff down, you know. And, uh, uh, and all of our kids, well, Micah was, Micah's pretty good in math. He's probably the best out of all of them. But, but Benjamin was good in math, too. And I said, you, you've got to keep that... You know, you can't just bend over. So, so reconciling is a very important thing in our life. And reconciling our bank statement to figure out if we have what they say we have. And it comes down to the point to where we can apply that to our life spiritually and say, has your sins been accounted for like God says they should be accounted for? I can't account for my own sins. I can't do it. I can't, I can't cover my own sins. The only way I do that is die and go to hell. 
But the Bible says that Jesus will reconcile and he will clean the slate and make it all the same across the board through the, his blood. Notice it says here, and, and that's what Paul, and of course he's writing from prison again, uh, going through these, these prison epistles. I know it seems like I'm preaching all the prison epistles, but uh, it's a lot of things through there. But, but anyway, um, here he says, you know, his message is simply, because of Jesus shed his blood, I can be reconciled to God. And you know, that's what kept Paul going. That is what keeps us going. That's what keeps me doing what I do. Did you know that, honestly, going out and, and knocking on those doors, and that terrifies me. That's the thing I enjoy the least. You know, I honestly would rather be uh, setting up tables and chairs. Well, I don't know if I'd really enjoy doing that, but, uh, um, but anyway. But, I, but that going out and... And, 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 you know, soul winning, that really terrifies me. I, I just, I, I'm not an outward going type person. But what keeps me going and what causes me to do that and what causes me to, to lay a gospel track on the table at the restaurant is I am saved and I want other people to be saved too. That's the only thing that it is, really. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for that, then I wouldn't say a word about it. I wouldn't even be at church, to be honest with you. If it wasn't the fact that other people can be saved, there wouldn't be anything, any use. Paul, like Paul said, I above all men would be most miserable if, if all it is is what we have in this world. So, so that's what kept Paul going. And that is the reason he did not quit. And that's the reason why he did not sit in the prison and say, woe is me. He wrote these letters. He told people, keep going, do right. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, do right till the stars fall. You know, just keep going, keep doing right. And that's what he said. So look at verse 19. Notice the fullness dwell. It says, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell in him. All the fullness should dwell in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And it pleased the Father. God the Father was not jealous. God the Father was not envious. God the Father was pleased that all the fullness of the Godhead could dwell in Jesus, the only begotten Son. Jesus was 100% man. He was 100% God. The God of very God. That's what Jesus was. And it says... You know, when we look at this verse, it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And of course, uh, you know, what strikes you maybe strikes you and what struck me the first time I was looking at this verse, this, the word Him refers back to Jesus Christ. And normally, when we are referring to God or Jesus or a deity, uh, or, you know, the deity, we capitalize the pronouns, Correct. It's not capitalized here. You notice that in your Bible in verse 19, it, him is not capitalized, but it refers back to Jesus. So normally we would capitalize it. And the reason is, is because the King James Version was, an, it was, was uh, you know, translated in England and brought over. So a very simple explanation for a lot of times that happens is, and you may or may not know this, but in Europe... They don't follow the same capitalization rules that we do here in America. Like, for example, the uh, the dates. They never they never capitalize the the month. You know, the beginning, the first letter in the you know word like February. They don't capitalize things. So their capitalization rules are totally different than what we are. You know, we have today. So so sometimes it is you know capitalized, and sometimes it's not. It's one of the weirdest things when going to Haiti. They, they rarely ever capitalize anything, you know. And another thing that got me unique was in a writing out numbers, they will put periods where commas are and commas where periods are. Yeah, that's confusing. <laughs> and the way they write the number one, it looks like a seven, 
That's why they put a little cross across the, the seven, and I, I do that to this day. I got used to doing that, and uh, it, it was very confusing. I was, you know, thinking all the ones were sevens, and I was trying to add a bunch of stuff up and thinking, this ain't adding up right. So, but, uh, but so their capitalization, so that's why it's not there. But we have it referring back to Jesus Christ. That's the him in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, or Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. So the question that is presented in, chapter, in verse number 13 through 15, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So you have these questions that are presented almost as if rhetorical questions like we have in, uh, in, in the book of Job when God says, who formed the, where were you when I formed the foundation of this earth? Who holds everything in place? Who created the behemoth? Who created the Leviathan? Who can pull the Leviathan out of the water? You know, those rhetorical questions. Sometimes, and, and as we look at these, we have these questions that are presented, but then God answers them through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the writer of Paul in the following verses, verses 16 and 18. It says, For, and this is the characteristics of, of Jesus, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he, verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the, head, from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, there are multiple things in here that we can look at. Number one, look at verse 16. You'll see that those words, very typical, you'll see those a lot of times. It's uh, the things that are visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Those you'll see several places referring to the things of evil, the things of Satan, the principalities, and the powers of the air, the darkness, those things are referred to multiple times in the scriptures as things that are against God. And so as he is talking here and he says the head of the body, the church, he is the head of the body of the church. In the church, we have the pastor who is the shepherd. But if the pastor ever says... He's the head of everything. You got a problem. Because Jesus is the head. The pastor is the shepherd. They say the, the evangelist is like the sheepdog. And I always said the missionary was like the vet. You know, he just kind of dealt with the people that showed up, you know. But the pastor wants everybody, wants to shepherd everybody. And that's the shepherding part of, of the, the call of a pastor. That pastor teacher. But we have to realize that God, through Jesus Christ, is the, the, he's the head of the body, of the church. You know, other people can set themselves up, but they're only fooling themselves. And so, here we have, and he says that word preeminence. Preeminence. The word eminence is a position of prominence or superiority. And the, the prefix pre means before. So, it's before the position of prominence or superiority. So Jesus, not only, you know, they, they refer to the Pope as your eminence. You know, refer to the Pope as your eminence. Uh, you know, they say, oh, your eminence and everything. I, I don't know that I'd ever do that, but uh, I've never met the Pope. Never, I don't ex ever expect to meet the Pope, but anyway... Um, but, and I, I would be respectful, I mean, honestly, you know, uh, it's like Joe Biden. Um, I'm not going to go seek an audience with him, but if he invited me to the White House, I'd put on my best suit, put on my cufflinks, do everything, you know, and, and get a nice haircut and everything, and go up there, and I would go to the White House and talk to him and give him the gospel. 
You know, some people say, I wouldn't even want to talk to him. The man needs to hear the gospel. Maybe he has, and who knows what's, you know, he's, he's rejected, but I would go and talk to him. If the Pope invited me over, I doubt that's going to happen, but if the Pope invited me, I'd put on my best suit and go over there. Well, I might even go buy me a new suit. I don't know. But I'd put on my best suit and uh, go down here to Gregory's and buy me a nice new suit down there at Gregory's and go uh, get me, you know, visit the Pope maybe. But I'd go and give the man the gospel. Okay, but, but I'm not going to say that he has the preeminence because only Jesus Christ should have the forefront place in our life. Now, I love my wife. I love my wife more than I love my kids because I, she was there first. Now, I love my kids. I'd die for my kids, but I'd die twice for my wife. You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is, but I love the Lord more. He has the preeminence. He has the first place. You see what I'm saying? He has the first place, and that's the way it is. And notice it says um, he is before. It says that he might have the preeminence, that place in your life that is greater than everything else, the preeminence. Now, John, uh, 3 John verse 9 uh, John writes about a man by the name of Diotrephes that he sought the preeminence. He said he loveth to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. So he wanted to be the first place. But we can't. If we ever move Jesus out of first place, we've made a wrong move. You know, I'm not a chess player and I ain't that great at checkers, but you can make a wrong move. And as soon as you make it and move your hand, you realize that it's too late. You can make a wrong move. The moment you move Jesus out of first place, you've made the wrong move. And I'll tell you, I've done that before in my life. And it hadn't been great. And so we have to put him in as the preeminence. Now, um, the next place here is another description of, of these terms and these words, remember I told you several places, if you'll turn over to Philippians chapter 2, you'll see where these types of, of things and these types of, of, uh, uh, of, of I, this idea comes from with giving God the first place. It's another description. Philippians chapter 2 verses 4 through 11 it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. What mind is it? How do we want to deal with this with preeminence? Well, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, here's the mind we need to have. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of servant and made and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore god also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above ev which is above every name that that the name of jesus every knee shall bow should bow of things in heaven of things in earth and in things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what is the position that we should take? Not in the preeminence, but in the form of a servant. We need to be just like Jesus to serve other people. It's not about, oh, look at me how great I am. You know, the, the, uh, uh, they said the, the competition was lost for the world's humblest man the moment he accepted a plaque, recognizing him as the world's humblest man. You know, so we should not sit there and say, oh, look at me, I'm doing this. No, we should all try to be like Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant and... What did he do just before he was arrested at, the, at the, the, the Last Supper? What did he do? 
He washed their nasty old yucky feet. Well, I'll tell you what. If the creator of the universe could humble himself and wash nasty, dirty feet of the disciples, I think I can go out and pass out some door knockers. I think I can leave some gospel tracks. I think I can see how I can help other people. I believe I can do it. Because here he was. He deserves the preeminence. He was above everything. It said everything in heaven and earth, everything below it, he's above it all. And he took upon him the form of a servant. He didn't even take that position of preeminence that he was due. He could have. He deserves to have the preeminence. But he said, no, I'm going to be the example. I'm going to show you how I want you to live. And wasn't that so great? He didn't. You know, now, we have it written down. We have, we have it written down for us in black and white. And thank the Lord in English, we have a great Bible right here in our own language. And we can read it. But he did far more than that. He lived it. He came down and said, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. And so he came and every knee at once will bow, and we know that. And then just in case there was any question whether he was, and turn back to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, just in case there's any doubt about this, Paul plainly writes, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just plainly. This is a, this is a uh, uh, the book of Colossians, uh, the book of Romans is a doctrinal book, but the book of Colossians lays out and gives proofs for many of the doctrines of, of Christology, pneumatology, and theology proper. And it lays those things out. And this is one of those for proving that Jesus is equal with the Holy Spirit and God the Father. So they're three in one. One's not greater than the other. They all have the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's right there. And so he who has all the fullness became a servant. And that's what we'd say. What should we do? Why we should copy Jesus and be a servant. We should copy Jesus and be the servant that we can. Now, if you want to go wash some people's feet, have at it. I hadn't had the Lord tell me that yet. I've washed my kids' feet, you know, when they were little and things like that. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but, but the fact of the matter is we need to humble ourselves and be a servant just like Jesus was. Now, look at verse 20. Let's go back to Colossians 1, verse 20. He says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be the things in earth or things in heaven. You know, Satan fell from heaven when he rebelled. The Bible says uh, in Isaiah, I beheld Satan falling as lightning, and he hit the earth and came to this earth. Um, and so Adam sinned, Satan fell, Adam sinned, the earth was cursed. But one day this earth is going to be returned back to its original state when there's a new heaven and a new earth. In, John, in Revelation chapter 19, 20, and 21, it tells us that one day it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a new Jerusalem coming down. And it's all going to be turned back to like it was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. Okay, uh, there's some speculation as to you know what you know what how that's going to take place and you know what it's exactly going to look like and we don't know because the Bible is just not clear enough. It just leaves some some things that's very vague. It tells us about those things, so we kind of speculate and people. I think sometimes people go off on the wrong tangent about that, and so I, I've learned one thing uh, a, a Bible interpretation principle, and it's this. When the Bible speaks loudly and distinctly about something, we should speak loudly and distinctly about that. When the Bible is kind of quiet on some things, we should be quiet. You know, uh, I read something years ago that, that helped me out in my early ministry. 
tremendously. Curtis Hudson said this. He said, he said, I have three lists that I keep, mental lists. He said, my first list is things I'm willing to die for. He said, my second list is things I'm willing to fight about but not die for. He said, and my third list is things I'm willing to fuss about but not fight about. And you know, that's where we need to filter things in the Bible about. You know, sometimes people want to argue, and, and uh, um, a friend of mine that was at Bob Jones years ago, he said that they got into an argument about, uh, about you know, the Bible says, when the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ will rise first. You know, they were saying, why is the dead in Christ got to rise first? And he said, he jokingly, he's from uh, Western Virginia, now the, you know, near the coal mining area and everything, and and uh, he said, uh, he said he was just joking. He said, "Well, they got further to go. They're six feet under." You know? <laughs> he said, "He has to give them a head start." And he said, "He said, I kid you not. Literally, this this guy got so mad at me and said, you can't say that." He said, "Because what if somebody is buried on a mountain and somebody's living down in a valley, or somebody's buried down in a valley and somebody's living up on a mountain?" The people on the mountain are further up to heaven than the people in the valley. And he got all upset, you know. And, and Brother Cliff said, I was just joking about the whole thing, you know. People get upset about things and want to argue about stuff. And, I mean, great day in the morning. I don't know why he's going to have the dead in Christ rise first. But it's what it says. And that's the only place in the Bible that says that. So let's just let it go and, and, and go on with it. There's more things we got to do, you know, to do. But, but the fact is that... We have Satan who is the prince and power of this air. That is something that's clear. That has said several times in the Bible. That Satan... Now, we know that God is in control of everything. But God has allowed Satan to control certain things and be and doing so. We can read the book of Job and find that out. Job, uh, in the chapter 1... The Bible says that the sons of God came present themselves uh, but to God and, and Satan was there. And he said, Satan, you know, what are you doing? He said, I'm walking to and fro through the earth to see, you know, who, what, who I can devour or whatnot, as it says in 1 Peter. <clears throat> and he said, have you considered my servant Job? And so we know that, that uh, certain things like that and Satan wants to destroy us. And he's the prince, and God gives him a, a, a free ability to do certain things. Why? I, we don't know the whys of everything, but we do know that the Bible says that he's the prince and power of the air. The, uh, the guy that ran the uh, BBN radio station in Charlotte, North Carolina, was telling me that, uh, you know, these radio towers, they actually share the... the uh, Power space with other radio stations, and so you have BBN, the you know the the Bible Broadcasting Nest Network that shares that same tower with uh, a rock radio station, and country music, and classical music, and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's on the same tower, and they just share and pay a part of it every month. And he said there will be an electrical situation, a lightning strike, or something. And the only transmitter on that whole tower where there's multiple radio stations on that and multiple transmitters and multiple electronic equipment, the only one that will have any damage will be the BBN one. And they're all grounded the same way. They're all made the same way. Some of them are the same equipment, net company name and everything. Why do you think that is? It's because Satan wants to stop the gospel from getting out. He's the prince and power of the air. He is. He wants to disturb. He wants to cause problems. He wants to do all kinds of stuff. And, but I'll tell you this. Satan is not omnipresent. He can't be all places at one time. You know, he can't, he can't, and, and honestly, and let's just be, I'm going to just be blunt. And, and I don't have this, I don't have any Bible about this, so this is, this is uh, Harry's how-to, you know, edition of, of how things work. I really don't think that Satan himself bothers with me personally. 
I think Satan is working on higher levels like congressmen, presidents, kings. I think that's where Satan is involved. I'm just a nobody. There's enough demons out there to take care of aggravating the life out of me. You know what I'm saying? I think Satan is on that higher level. I think that's where he operates. Now, do I have specific Bible for that? No, that's just free. That's extra. That don't cost anything. That's just, that's just my two cents. So for us to say, oh, the devil's really causing me problems. And I know what you mean by that. But really, when you think about it theologically and everything, it's probably more demons and everything. I'm telling you what, in Haiti, I saw all kind of stuff. And you would, it would, you would not believe some of the stuff that we saw. In fact, this morning... You know, the, what happened in here is very calm. It was like nothing happened compared to stuff that we've had to deal with in services before. You know, I even had roosters fighting at my feet one time when I was preaching. I was, they were tied up. We had, a, we had a, 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 a harvest festival where everybody brought stuff out of their garden as an offering, you know, and brought it in. And people bring goats. They'd bring chickens. One time we had a duck, had turkeys. And they brought these, and they'd tie the legs up of the, the, the chickens, and they'd have these two roosters, and they put under the communion table thing that we had. And those dumb things started fighting right there under where, and I preached. I had a pulpit. I didn't have a pulpit like this. I just preached from the table. And those dumb things started fighting right at my feet. And I'm having to sit there and kick them while I'm preaching, you know, and hold the Bible and, and everything. And uh, another time I'm sitting there preaching, and we had just a tarp. And uh, out in the open, and I had bungee cords and trying to hold it. You know, they were absolutely amazed at bungee cords. They never seen anything like it. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. They would take inner tubes and cut them up in strips and braid them. And I'm telling you what, those things were strong as, as everything. They, I mean, I trust my life to one of those inner tube things. But still, I had bungee cords that I brought, and we tied, you know, hooked them to a tree, and they were just, oh, Pastor Harry, that's 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 some new technology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, you know. But I'm sitting there, and I'm holding my Bible, and I mean, the wind is blowing, and my Bible's going everywhere, and the the wind starts, and it takes that tarp and those bungee cords, and it pushes, the wind comes down on it and pushes the tarp almost to the ground and it's on people's heads and I'm sitting there hollering and dust is a-blowing and everything and I'm holding the tarp up and I'm holding my Bible just like this and holding the tarp up and I'm hollering and I'm trying to preach and my pages are going flying, you know, and the notes and everything and I'm sitting there holding this up and finally I just give up and I just quit preaching and I said, God wants to save you. If you want to get saved, come down, but I'm done preaching. And I put my Bible down and the tarp comes down. And we had like seven or eight people come forward. <laughs> I don't know if they're afraid they're going to die or whatnot. But, uh, uh, but, they, but I mean, so, you know, we've had some weird things. And I know that Satan, he wants to disrupt. He wants to cause problems. He wants to stop the gospel from getting out. But, you know, in the hierarchy of, of satanic matters, I think really... He's on a higher plane. He doesn't. Ha he can't be everywhere at the same place. I heard a preacher say one time, he can't be everywhere at the same place like God can, and he can't be on my back and on your back at the same time, you know, causing you problems. So, so that's that prince and power, it's powers of the air, and the wickedness in high places there uh, in Ephesians. And I'm sorry, I, I forgot to tell you to turn there, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. But he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. He says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. There it is again powers against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now don't you know when they talk about the presidency, they call it the highest office in the land? It's the high office. 
Don't you think that's interesting? He said, the wickedness in high places. Now, some places in the world, and, and I understand, you know, it could mean, you know, the literal places where they worship idols and things like that, and, and I get that. But again, I, I really believe that that's the level Satan is working on. I mean, you listen to some of the stuff Nancy Pelosi, you listen to some of the stuff that Chuck Schumer and some of the Democrats, and, and uh, listen, that's Satan at work right there. I was listening to this thing the other day, and, and I know this is not a place for political you know, commentary, but I'm just going to say it out here right now. I was listening to a thing where a, a, a Democratic state representative was presenting her bill and was being challenged. And he said he asked her point blank, How many weeks do you say it's okay for the abortion? And she said, and this ain't no lying, you go back and watch it on, on the YouTube thing. She said that if the doctor deemed it medically necessary up until she is in active labor delivering the baby that they could abort the baby. And he said, and get, now, now you think about this, that phrase, medically necessary. The doctor would have to do an evaluation to make sure it's medically necessary. While the baby is being born, they could abort the baby. And he said this, in your bill you say that mental anguish is a necessary medical need for abortion. Now, I watched all four of my kids being born and my wife was in, med in mental anguish. And she said, yes, if the doctor evaluated the, the mother and she was in mental anguish, they could abort the baby. Now, church, that's wicked right there. Amen. That is evil and wicked. Absolutely evil and wicked. You can't tell me Satan is not working on, on that kind of stuff. And so, the Bible says, these are the things. He said, be careful about these. Put on the armor of God. Now, let's see what's going to come about about these. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Turn back to Colossians chapter 1. So here you have these principalities, these rulers of darkness and wicked places and terrible things in high places, the spiritual wickedness. And what's going to happen to those things? Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in, the, in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and before all things and by him all things consist. Here's what's going to happen. He created it. He can uncreate it too. And that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a judgment day. There's going to, as R.G. Lee said, there's going to be a payday someday. And God's in control, and we can't ever forget that. He created it, and He's going to uncreate it. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, Genesis 3.15, all the way back when God said, I will put enmity between the woman and the, 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 between the seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what about that enmity or that separation? And I, for sake of time, I'll read this Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 through 16. Having abolished in his flesh the enemy, enmity, he abolished that enmity, that separation. He abolished it. Even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself a twain, of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. That enmity that existed all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says the death on the cross, it has slain that enmity. That separation. There was a separation between God and man. 
and that there were sacrifices. They had to have the sacrifices in the temple. It started in the tabernacle with Moses. And they said, you have to do the Day of Atonement, and you have to do these, you have to do this. And then they had the temple. And then when Jesus said, it is finished, the Bible says the veil in the temple rent from top to bottom. And you know what? The temple is not in existence today because we don't need it. Because Jesus was the Lamb of God. And He solved that separation problem. I accepted Jesus as my Savior and I don't ever have to worry about separating from Him again. Now the fellowship can be messed up if I'm in sin. But that enmity was slain thereby. Verse 21 and you, that you were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Notice it says reconciled, not reconciling, because salvation is a one-time thing. Sanctification is an ongoing thing. But salvation was a one-time thing. It was completed and secured by his power and because of his perfection, and because of his life, it was completed and secured. And it stays, and it's not because of my faithfulness, it's because of his faithfulness that we see, and because of his word. His word will not return void. And we see those things. So verse 22, we see the results and the benefits of reconciliation in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You see, in the past, present, and future, we have dealings with sin. In the past, we're saved from the, the penalty of sin. In the present, we are saved from the power of sin. And in the future, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Praise God. We won't have to worry about it anymore. And we'll be done with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it'll all be done away with. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Every single one of us has the ministry of reconciliation. Paul says we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We've looked at this and we've seen this and, and we see that Jesus reconciled us to him and he did away with the enmity or the separation when he reconciled us to him. And John 3, 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the, uh, the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. Not to have big houses and fancy clothes and nice chariots and things like that. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, you can be saved today and know and settled and secured, and then we can be busy helping others become reconciled to God. That's our ministry. You say, well, I don't know that I'm called to the ministry. Oh, yes, you are. Every saved individual is called to the ministry of reconciliation. Getting the gospel out and telling people how to be saved. It's as simple as passing out a gospel tract. That's what every saved person is saved to do, is to tell. We're saved to tell the story. Not to convert people, but just to tell the story. Jesus said, my burden is light, my yoke is easy. And we have heavy burdens sometimes because we pick up the wrong burden. Our burden is just to tell the story. Just to tell the story and let God do the rest, and the Holy Spirit do the rest. And so that's what we are to do to give and to reconcile uh, the, the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, thank you for your sacrificial death on the cross. Help me to honor your sacrifice and be more active in the ministry of reconciliation through my day-to-day -day activities and through my, uh, through my life and a testimony, to have a testimony of the joy that I get from being saved. And I know sometimes I don't live up to that. I know a lot of times that uh, I let my attitude uh, determine my altitude, and it's not good. But I pray, Lord, that you'd help me to be more active in the ministry of reconciliation. Encourage the people tonight with this message, and I pray that they get a, a glimpse into the, the desire that you have 
for people to be reconciled to you. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Hymn number 131, Jesus Paid It All. We're just going to sing a, one or two verses, and then we're going to all come down, all that can, uh, and gather around down this way and, and pray after we sing. Ah.